Good morning. On Thursday, we said an earthly goodbye to a faithful sister in the Lord who had been a member of our church family here for over 25 years. Humanly speaking, the last years of her life had been uh, difficult, very difficult, succumbing to that cruel disease that appears to take away the very faculty of the mind. And yet for all who knew her, even to the end, God's indwelling spirit shone brightly in Enid's life. Those who gathered for her funeral did so in the hope of resurrection life for Enid. It's what we believe as Christians. It's fundamental to our faith. And yet the, the, the pain of a bereavement, in that pain sometimes we can question that. We can question what we believe. We might ask, is this really true what we believe or, or is it just wishful thinking? If we're honest, it's not just a bereavement that does that to us, is it? That unexpected diagnosis, for example, that can trigger uh, a few questions. The realisation that I've got less of my life to live now than I have already lived, that certainly prompts a few questions. That ongoing struggle with sin, that doesn't, doesn't seem to be getting anywhere. Why is that? Is it really possible? That can prompt a few questions. Well, friends, Paul knew this. He knew there would be times when we would feel uh, weaker, when we would be more uncertain, when we would be less sure. And that is why Romans 8 is such a cracking part of God's word, because in it, Paul delivers a truckload of assurance for believers. And verses 5 through to 11 are designed in particular to give us assurance in this life as we battle against sin and assurance in the next as we overcome death. So let's pray and ask God for his help as we look at those verses now. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that there are times that we feel weak and unsure. Please, by the power of your Spirit dwelling within us, Please would you speak assurance into our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Romans chapter 8 is widely regarded as one of the high points of God's Word, not least because it begins, as we saw last week uh, in verse 1, with no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then it ends, as we'll see in a few weeks' time, in verse 39, saying that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. These are the great bookends of the chapter, if you like. No condemnation, no separation. And everything that we read and understand in between that needs to be understood and read in that context. Let me just remind you where we got to uh, last week with those first four verses. Verse 3 tells us that God has done what the law could not do. What couldn't the law do? Well, with two things, two things. The law can't uh, deal with the condemnation that I already deserve for my past sinful actions. That's the first thing it can't do. And secondly, it can't deal with my ongoing and my future sinfulness. Last week we heard chapter 7 being read, didn't we? Who will deliver me? Who will rescue me, Paul says. Well, verses 1 to 4 pro provide the most wonderful, the most liberating answer. The answer is Jesus. Jesus will rescue. Jesus will deliver. He deals with my condemnation for me by going to the cross and dying in my place. That's verse 3. And he, and he makes a change in me by his Spirit. That's verse 4. So what we're about to read in these next few verses is all about the significance of this change, this transformation by the power of the Spirit in the lives of every believer. Christ dying for us opens up the possibility of Christ in us through the Spirit. So two points to share with you this morning. The first that we see in these verses is that there is an unbreakable connection an unbreakable connection between the spirit and life on the one hand, but also between flesh and death on the other. Spirit and life on the one hand, flesh and death on the other. So let's reread verses 5 through to 8 
and track, see if we can track the contrast in these verses. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, what we need to get clear straight away is that in using this contrasting language of flesh and spirit, Paul is describing the difference between those who are Christians and those who aren't Christians. He is not describing or contrasting here um, a Christian who is sometimes perhaps more captured by those things we would term fleshly and sometimes by those things that we might term more spiritual. He's not saying that the flesh is physical and the spiritual is non-physical. No, he is contrasting two mutually exclusive orientations or attitudes. And Paul uses flesh flesh as, as a shorthand, if you like, to describe the whole order of fallen humanity apart from God and and that the bias of that uh, um, fallen humanity towards evil. So he has in mind its thinking, he has in mind its its value systems, he has in mind its 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 ambitions, he has in mind its goals, its its desires and, and its lusts. And you see, apart from the grace of God, this is what our mindsets are locked into. And look where it leads. It leads to death, verse 6. It leads to hostility to God, verse 7. It is an impossibility to please God, verse 8. So to be a Christian is to transform, tr- transfer from this realm that is dominated by the flesh to a realm that is dominated by the spirit, a realm that is characterised by life and by peace, verse 6. Now here's the thing, after reading these verses you'd expect Paul to add in um, a, a word of um, instruction, maybe a so, so now walk in the spirit. Or if not an instruction, maybe maybe uh, a warning or something. You know, do, do not follow the ways of the world; it'll it'll end badly. Maybe you're expecting him to do something like that. That will come, but but these verses are unusually empty of of any instruction or warning. <laughs> In one sense, they're a they're a preacher's nightmare because I've I've got nothing to tell you to do. But that's the point. That's exactly the point. We are supposed to listen to these descriptions and be assured. Because our assurance doesn't come from what we can do, but from what God has done and what God has declared in his word. If we depended on what we could do for our assurance, we'd we'd be well and truly scuppered, wouldn't we? No, we listen to God, we believe in faith what he tells us he has done, and that is where our assurance comes from. And his word here tells us that those in the spirit, those who have become Christians, those for whom Jesus' and Jesus's death on the cross means no condemnation, those who have had their mindsets changed by the spirit, those people have an unbreakable connection with God himself. Verse 6 calls it life and peace, where peace doesn't just mean a state of mind or or, or an emotion. No, it's talking about a a reconciliation with God. It's talking about an end to hostility. It's contrasted with uh, that hostility in verse 7. It's the opposite to that. It is a restored friendship with God. Now, Paul doesn't explicitly challenge his Roman readers uh, here, but that doesn't mean there isn't a challenge. But it's not actually for the Christian. The challenge is for those who are reading or watching now and, and, and maybe thinking, you know, this, this hasn't happened to me. Uh, 
The Holy Spirit hasn't changed my mindset. In fact, I'm not all that sure I'm, I'm bothered about pleasing God in, in, in how I live. I mean, I do live a good life. I, I don't swear. I, I don't drink too much. I, I give to charity. I try and put other people be, before my, myself. I, I live a, a good life, which in one sense is great if this life is, is all there is. But if it's not, and that, that, those thoughts kind of resonate with you, then the implicit warning here is that such a, a way of living leads to death. And it leads to eternal separation from the very one who wanted you to come into existence. To ignore God, to deny his authority, to have your mind set in an opposite direction is a perilous situation to be in, a really, really perilous situation to be in. Maybe today would be a good day to ask the Lord to change your mindset to one that leads to life. Because once God has done that, once he has changed your mindset, you'll be on an unbreakable trajectory that leads both to life now and life into eternity. That's my second main heading this morning. It's from verses 9 to 11, an, an unbreakable trajectory. Verse 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. We might say since uh, uh, the, the Spirit of God dwells in you. So if there's any doubt among Paul's original Roman readers as to which camp they were in, Paul spells it out for them here. And, and actually by implication, he spells it out for all Christians down through the ages. They were on the side of the Spirit. We are on the side of the Spirit. Likewise, the positional status of those not in the Spirit is, is also clarified. He says, this is still verse 9, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Of course, to state that we are on an, uh, on an unbreakable trajectory to eternal life may raise questions. May raise questions such as, well, if this is true, why on earth do I keep on sinning? You know, consider the believer battling with specific temptations and, and seemingly winning, not just for weeks or even months, but, but years, winning, winning for years. Surely this is evidence of their sanctification and, and their growth in maturity. And then, in a moment of weakness, out of nowhere, they find themselves in a place that they hadn't expected to be in again, succumbing to that same old temptation. Or what about our toleration of those so-called little sins? You know, those, those little things, a stretch of the, the truth here or a bit of gossip there. An uncontrolled but justified outburst there or a couple of more drinks here. They weren't that bad. It wasn't that big a deal. And then all of a sudden when you, what you thought was small, what you thought was inconsequential has just blown up and cause massive ramifications, massive damage, hurt to those that you love. I was brought up short just this week by how easily I'd entertained uh, lying in a bid to make myself look better in a scenario. I could go on, couldn't I, with my own personal examples. I could go on with hypothetical examples. How can we be in the spirit and yet keep on thinking like that? How can we keep be in the spirit and yet keep on doing that? How can we be in the spirit and keep on saying that? Keep on giving in in that way? We're back to the territory of chapter 7, aren't we? Why is it that I do the things I don't want to do and yet I don't do the things that I do want to do? Well, in one sense, of course, that comment perfectly articulates the truth of the Christian in this unbreakable connection and in this unbreakable trajectory. Because our very frustration at our actions, our anger, our, our despair, our, our repentance, our regret, our intention to resolve the situation and, and to try and get it right when we've got it wrong, all these things are evidence that we are on the unbreakable trajectory towards eternal life. 
Verse 10 says, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. In other words, if you are a believer, yes, it's true that your body is still subject to physical death and decay. Yes, it's true that you're still prone to sin. You're tempted to let the flesh take control. But it's also true that the Spirit is in you now, imparting life to you now. And as we said at the start, that's only possible because of what God has done for us through Jesus on the cross. It's incredible to think that without the cross, if the Holy Spirit took up residence in us, we would be utterly consumed, we'd be utterly condemned, we'd be utterly destroyed because of our sin. But because Jesus' righteousness um, is counted as our own, because of that great exchange, the Spirit is life. And the Spirit will do his work. He will do it through illness. He will do it through pain and and suffering. He will do it through that sin on an unbreakable trajectory to eternal life itself. Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Which means... Dear believer, this means that the same person God used to resurrect Jesus is living inside you right now. The Holy Spirit of God indwelling in you is exactly the same Holy Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead and who will one day do exactly the same to you. We're all in the, in the midst of a trial right now, aren't we? To a greater or lesser extent, this COVID situation has resulted in pressures and disruptions and isolation and pain for many of us. On top of that, you may be in a situation where you are still coming to terms with the, the loss of a loved one. Perhaps you're looking down the barrel of a a diagnosis for you or a friend that means that that life will will never be the same again. Maybe you've been praying for change in your life. Maybe you've been praying for change in someone else's life, someone close to you, and you've been praying for years and years now, and it seems more unlikely than ever that God is going to answer in the way that you long for him to answer. Or maybe you've just hit rock bottom following yet another failed attempt to live like you want to live but somehow can't. If any of that is true of you, look at these verses. Hear what the Lord God Almighty is saying to you and the assurance that he is giving in these verses. You are in an unbreakable connection with him now and you are on an unbreakable trajectory with him into eternal life. So take heart. The Spirit of God is in you bringing life now and one day what God has begun in part in this life he will bring to perfection in the next. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that speaks assurance into our lives. Please, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you give us eyes to see and hearts to believe these wondrous truths. Whatever situation, whatever circumstances you have currently placed us in, we thank you that you have promised to complete to perfection the work that you have begun in us. How we long for that day, Lord. But in the meantime, would you help us to faithfully rest in the knowledge that we are being kept in an unbreakable connection with you. We praise you for that, Father. We praise you for that, Son. We praise you for that, Holy Spirit. Amen.